Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. It's hard to think of a more insanely flagrant violation of the basic international order than bombing a city while the U.N. Secretary General is there on a peacemaking mission. Well, that's exactly what happened today. Russian forces apparently bombed the capital city of Kyiv in Ukraine while U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres was there for talks with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Ukraine's foreign minister is condemning it as a heinous act of barbarism. It's quite a provocative act of violence as this war enters its new phase. Because, well, remember, it was not supposed to be like this, and not just according to me, according to Putin. Russian President Vladimir Putin was very clear from the beginning, this was not going to be a war. Back in February, he gave a long speech where he called it, quote, a special military operation with the made-up justification of liberating Russian loyalists in the country's east and denazifying the country. In fact, Russia even made it illegal for the press in that country to call it a war or an invasion, which in turn caused the independent Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta to move operations to Latvia after it received multiple warnings from government officials over its accurate coverage of the war as a war. The final straw came after the state banned the publication of an interview that Russian journalists conducted with President Zelensky. Now, all of this was done on purpose, even though it seems almost bizarre and paranoid, like you're waging a war. People are going to know about it, right? Because here's the thing. Putin chose his language very carefully. Even though he's obviously an authoritarian leader without any real political opposition, the fact is public opinion still does matter. And war, total war, and mobilization for it are costly endeavors. They often require extremely difficult, unpleasant sacrifices from people. But Putin wanted to have it both ways, right? That was the plan here. He wanted a quick, strategic blitzkrieg to take out Zelensky, to encircle Kyiv, install a more favorable government, and then Russian troops could return home triumphant with some sort of puppet regime next door and without much change to day-to-day -day life for the Russian people. All a nice and tidy special military operation. Obviously, that didn't happen. In fact, you know that Putin even promised that Russia would not conscript troops to be deployed into the conflict. And then the defense ministry actually had to come out and admit that wasn't true, that conscripts were taking part in the invasion and some had been captured as prisoners of war. Now, Russia's special military operation as, again, a quick in and out operation that doesn't require conscripts, that requires no societal sacrifice, that failed entirely. That's clear. They took unbelievable losses. According to one recent estimate from the UK Defense Secretary, Russia has lost 15,000 soldiers so far. That is equivalent to the total Russian losses during its 10-year losing war in Afghanistan. And as we said before in the show, you can't spin away the death of your son when his body comes back from the war. To say nothing of the fact that Russia is now largely isolated on the world stage as a result of the invasion, crushing sanctions, leaving civilians unable to access basic financial services. It doesn't matter if you call it a war or a special military operation if, you know, you can no longer use your Visa or MasterCard to ride the Metro. And there's no end in sight. Right now, the conflict is escalating, not winding down. Ukraine is using the immense weapons support it's receiving from the U.S. and EU to fend off a Russian assault on the eastern part of the country. And so Russia and Putin basically faces a fork in the road. De-escalation or doubling down. Does Vladimir Putin try to find a way out of this? Does he use his current control of territory in the east, stretching up from Crimea, which of course he seized in 2014, all the way up almost to Kharkiv, to negotiate some kind of settlement where Ukraine cedes the Donbass to the Russians or declares it some quasi-independent federated region, something like that? Or does Putin decide that he has done as much as he can with this special operation framing, but now needs to start preparing for total war? There are some really troubling signs that it may be the latter. As the Center for European Policy Analysis reports, quote, Russia's military believes that limiting the war's initial goals is a serious error. They now argue that Russia is not fighting Ukraine, but NATO. If true, this is a serious escalation. Putin would need to get the Russian people on board. And to that end, many observers of Russian, Russian media have been noting over the past two weeks or so very ominous signs precisely along those lines. As one expert from the RAND Corporation notes, quote, Russian television has been flooded with statements urging escalation as part of an existential struggle. 
Russian state media, which is under strict control, of course, is selling the line that NATO and the West are instigating World War III and that Russia needs a massive war effort in response. Take a listen to one commentator on Russian state TV accusing Western allies of causing a large war on Tuesday. Russia будет и остается открыто миру и принципиальным образом несет три вещи мировому порядку. Первое это справедливость, второе это мир и третье это безопасность. А вот эти все коллеги пытаются развязать большую войну. Они ее уже фактически развязали. You can also see this kind of grim fatalism. And I want to play this alarming bit of sound from one of Putin's top propagandists. This aired on a very popular Russian political program on Tuesday night. Недавно тоже участвовал в одной такой дискуссии. И один из экспертов говорил, что, ну, в общем, два пути. Или мы проигрываем на Украине, мы, значит, Россия, и все вот это вот сдаем. Или начинается Третья мировая. И я его спрашиваю, говорю, а вы сами какой путь считаете наиболее реалистичным? Лично я считаю наиболее более реалистичным путь Третьей мировой. Ну, потому что, зная нас, зная нашего руководителя Путина Владимира Владимировича, зная, как вообще здесь все устроено, это невозможно. Ну, то есть, ну, нет вообще шансов, что мы просто сложим лапки и скажем, ой, вы знаете, не получилось. Мы думали, что сейчас вот мы защитим Донбасс, наведем порядок, демилитаризируем, денацифицируем. Но что-то пошло не так, не получилось, поэтому, ну, извините, мы обратно. Этого просто не может быть. Вот самое невероятное, что в конце концов все это закончится ядерным ударом, мне представляется все же более вероятным, чем вот такое развитие событий. К ужасу моему, с одной стороны, с другой стороны, к пониманию, что ну что, значит так. Знаешь, меня... Но мы это в рай. Да. Меня... А они просто а, да. This is what it is. It's all racing towards nuclear Armageddon. This being the possibility of nuclear Armageddon, because Putin will not, cannot, we Russians cannot accept defeat. I mean, she says it all very clearly, right? I mean, even in that state TV propaganda, there she is essentially admitting it didn't work out, right? And so the question becomes, what does this rhetoric from Russian media translate to on the ground? Is it just bluster or does it reflect how people are feeling on the ground? In the past, there was almost something reassuring, at least about a month ago, right, or two weeks ago, in at least the way the Russian military seemed willing to cut its losses. But increasingly, at least according to state media, that appears less likely than it once did. So when you hear things like that, when you hear state media saying, well, we can't quit now, what does the next phase of this war look like? What is Vladimir Putin willing to do? A big part of that depends on what the Russian public will ultimately abide. I'm joined now by Ilya Yablokov, a lecturer of journalism and digital media at the University of Sheffield in England. He's the author of Fortress Russia, Conspiracy Theories in the Post-Soviet World, recently wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times about the five conspiracy theories that Putin has weaponized. Um, as a, someone who is a close monitor of Russian media and, and the sort of discourse, I guess first question is, what do you take away from the messages now being sent on Russian state media about this conflict? Hi, Chris. Uh, I think it's very important to know that uh, it's all like a game. It's the game for the Kremlin. It's the game for all these propaganda bullhorns to say that the nuclear war is coming to prepare the population for the worst. Uh, but I, I've been studying these guys for many, many years, and I can say that I don't think they are ready to die themselves. <laughs> uh, it's all about sable rattling. It's all about corruption and cynicism. Uh, so when they say these things, they certainly want to play the line of hardliners in the Kremlin that try to push uh, Vladimir uh, Putin for the harsh measures, even for using the tactical uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, but I, 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 at the same time, I believe it is part of this gamification of the war uh, that was created in Russia thanks to the propaganda. Well, that, that, I mean, that's sort of what I've, I've been trying to parse here, right? Because at a certain level, mm -hmm. they, they almost sound, I mean, it, Russian state TV like that, like, th there's something that's somewhat familiar about it. I mean, we have our own versions of propaganda here. It doesn't look like a North Korean news broadcast, right? Like, it's got these pundits, yeah. and they're giving, their, they're giving their takes, and some of them are kind of spicy. And, and I can't tell how much mm -hmm. of this is the kind of demagoguery of just chess beating and we will never bow down, and how much of it is strategically aimed at driving a, a, a 
preparing a populace for something truly awful to come. But think about that. So there are people in Russia who consume this content and who totally believe that. So for them, whatever they say, it's going to be truth, like absolute truth. They believe every word these guys say. So at the same time, there is a spread of these uh, these memes, these videos online, and another dozen million believe that or at least hear that and think about the worst scenarios. The other part of the population is scared, and this is another message that the population should get that we are super crazy and don't do not mess with us. Right. Do not start the revolution. Do not start any outbreaks inside the country. But it's also about you guys uh, who consume this information from the outside. And this this is the message for you. You should be aware because we are crazy enough to do that. Right. So start conversation with us. This is the message to the United hmm. States too.